Okay, today we're going to talk about malware and ransomware, and I'm going to go over what it is, a brief history of how it came about, and um, where we're standing today in attacks. Uh, a lot of this will probably uh, seem like it's targeted for corporations or large organizations, and in a way it is, because that's what... Um, the uh, bad guys are targeting these days. Uh, the, the small um, user, the single user, your home, uh, is really not that aggressively being attacked by the big uh, malware villains. Uh, it's being attacked now, and I'll talk about it, by uh, startups, <laughs> we'll call them. And, and I'll get into that. Uh, let me first tell you what malware, mal it's either pronounced malware or malware, uh, but malware uh, stands for malicious software. And um, as I say in the next sentence that a virus is malware, but not all malware is a virus. And here are some of the examples of malware that, um, that uh, is not a virus. Uh, ransomware, uh, again, where they go and they encrypt your data. Worms, which uh, go out and reproduce throughout the, uh, the network. Uh, and by the way, the first computer worm uh, hit the internet on November 2nd, uh, 1988, and it was the Morris worm. This was a worm that uh, that Robert Morris was developing uh, as a proof of concept, and it got out of his lab. So here we have a case of a worm getting out, might even call it a virus, <laughs> getting out of a, a lab <laughs> that's supposed to be confined. Um, anyway, it, he's also the first one to be prosecuted and to be convicted of a federal crime for doing that. The other uh, types of uh, malware, uh, scareware, that's where all of a sudden you'll get uh, a warning popping up on your screen saying, we've detected that your operating system has a major flaw. Please click this button to upgrade your devices. A again, it's trying to scare you and use social engineering to get you to uh, click on the button. Uh, then we have adware, spyware, and pups, potentially unwanted programs. Uh, this can range from uh, a uh, software that you download that's free, and to make it free, what they do is they'll start popping up uh, adware where you, when you uh, log in, you'll get messages, you know, buy this, this is available. And usually the, the, uh, the vendor of the software also will say, now you can upgrade to the pro version or whatever. Uh, so they're not really dangerous, but they can be annoying. Uh, then we go to rootkits. This is something that uh, is very dangerous and pretty hard to find in that what they do is they dig down deep in the file system and hide uh, their, uh, their package such that it is um, almost, uh, I'll say almost impossible to find just doing a quick search. Um, there are ways to hide things in a file system um, where you can't see them. Those of you who know Unix, you know, just putting a dot in front of the file name uh, makes it invisible. Um, to your list command. And uh, even though you, there are ways to show it, in most cases, if you're just doing a quick look, you won't see it. Uh, the next one is fileless malware. Here, the package is basically embedded in some part of your RAM, some part of your cache, um, in headers, 
um, it's it doesn't exist as a separate file that you can look for. Uh, there are a lot of instances of this, and I'll talk a little bit about it uh, later on. Uh, the bot herders are uh, a new one, and what this is, they're sending out bots, which are stands for the uh, robots that they send out and will make your machine a, a zombie doing whatever they will it to do. And some of the uh, processes, if they find that you have a, uh, a, a good graphics card, an adequate graphics card, they'll uh, start doing crypto mining on your computer, uh, all be known to you, and sending the results back to them. Uh, and the other thing is, which uh, is the coordinated denial of service attack. Here, they'll take over IoT devices and uh, start using them to flood the target with a lot of uh, pa uh, malformed packets that will um, uh, overwhelm the, uh, the target. And they're hoping that uh, a bug is, will be uncovered or exists that will allow them to get into that, uh, that target. Here's a history of ransomware. Uh, in 1989, and you can see that it's pretty well near the beginning of the, um, the, um, the start of the internet, and it's called the AIDS Trojan. And it was published, I shall say, by a, uh, a disgruntled doctor. And it was an AIDS conference that was happening. And he managed to insert this virus onto a floppy disk that was going out to all the prospective attendees. And of course, you put the floppy into your computer and it gets infected. And uh, basically it was pay off to a bank. Um, it, it really wasn't that dangerous, that well thought out, but again, it was the first instance. Uh, then you have in 2005 and 2006, um, again, they're, um, they're using a heavier form of encryption. Uh, they're still using Trojans that are placed in the email or somewhere else. Um, and what they were forcing you to do was buy something from a website. Uh, uh, you could almost think of this as adware nowadays. Um, then in 2008, the big thing happened, which was Bitcoin. And that changed the whole paradigm. Prior to that, tracking any money payoffs was quite easy. So if you told them, uh, I want $10,000 put into this bank account, uh, Again, the government has a, um, a law that any deposit of over $10,000 is traced. So they could easily uh, find where it came from and where it was going. Uh, but when Bitcoin came out, it really changed it in that you can now uh, demand payment and it would all be anonymous. Uh, you never really know who's getting the payment. Uh, the, the next, as it went along, uh, you see in 2012, uh, they, the bad guys started to hone uh, their uh, process uh, and they still haven't been using Bitcoins, but in 2013 is when they really started to use the Bitcoin as the payoff mechanism. Um, they were using asymmetric encryption uh, and again, using email attachments, phishing schemes. Uh, and that pretty much has continued all the way up 
to today. Uh, in 2018, they started to um, come out with new variants uh, that would avoid detection and hide in your backups. So even if you had a backup, it would be able to, uh, uh, if you reinstalled your system, it would be able to uh, reactivate again. Uh, this shows you who gets attacked. This was around the July timeframe uh, of this year. And this is the random ransomware attacks per organization by industry. And as you can see, healthcare was and almost still is the, the major attack. Uh, and as Willie Sutton says, why do you rob, uh, when asked, why do you rob banks? And his answer was, that's where the money is. And obviously, healthcare these days is where a lot of the money is. The next one is utilities. Uh, and again, uh, it's a um, it's a necessary item so that if the item isn't there, a lot of people are affected. So they're more willing to pay off than to haggle or to uh, try to uh, remove it. And again, as you can see, insurance companies, software vendors, manufacturers, even ISPs are infected communication systems, government, military, uh, banking, consultants, education, on down the list. And we, the lonely person, sit way down at the bottom. There are six stages of a ransomware attack and any malware attack also fit into this. It's just that they'll do something else instead of the encryption phase. The first phase is the uh, campaign phase where they look for and attack exploits of the compute of the internet environment. In other words, they'll look for servers that uh, have uh, easily uh, uh, attackable uh, software. Um, they'll use code that can get in. Um, They'll uh, do um, uh, social engineering to, to propagate um, employees to click on an, uh, on a, uh, on an email and also bring, it, bring in the, uh, the infection. Um, the next, the second phase is the infection phase, and that's where the malicious code is brought into the target environment and starts executing. The next phase is, is staging. And if you go back and think of the old virus paradigm, uh, pre-malware and pre-ransomware, the infection was pretty much near the last stage. Uh, in most cases, it would do damage. Uh, but wouldn't really be looking for uh, money payoffs or anything like that. Um, but the, the staging phase is one of the uh, levels that brings in uh, <clears throat> the, that the infection communicates with the attacker's server and starts communicating and sending data back and forth, um, getting ready to attack the entire network. The, the, uh, the, uh, per, the, the organization's network. And the next phase is scanning where they start going through the file systems, the servers, uh, everything that's available on the network and mapping it out and deciding uh, what's important, what's targetable, um, whether or not you have backups that they can get a hold of, uh, all those uh, things that they would want to know and also see how much you're, you'd be willing to pay for it. For example, if they found out that your whole operation is run by 
uh, Uncle Bob sitting at a, a desk pushing switches, they're going to know that there's not much they can do to uh, demand ransomware. But again, if your whole process is controlled by the Internet of Things, then they know they have a, a good victim. Uh, once they know their targets, they start the encryption process and or stealing data or destroying backups. Uh, here is where the real work gets done. And after all they've finished doing that phase, the next phase is, of course, the payday. And this is where the ransom note appears on your computers and the conditions for getting rid of it are presented. Now, uh, way back in 1989, when the first one, the first malware ransomware was released, it went through these stages, but you can see that a lot of the stages were not well honed. They, uh, for example, the payday, uh, you were given a bank account to, to go to or, or, or purchase uh, items from a given website. So in a lot of cases, um, each one of these phases has become uh, more and more um, uh, refined to be able to attack specific systems. Um, the attack vectors, these are how they get you to uh, infect your, your systems. And by far the biggest one is malicious emails and phishing attacks. And this uses social engineering. And I'll, I'll give you examples and talk about it uh, uh, later on in the talk. Uh, the next one is stolen credentials, data breaches. This is a big one um, because a lot of the malware and uh, ransomware now is not only taking the, the, or not only encrypting your data, but also stealing it. So it knows that, okay, this database might be all your clients and might have all their social security numbers, all the information that they need and are taking that and will use that to attack um, other systems and other vendors. The next one is the zero day attack. And um, this gets its name from uh, zero day in that that's when um, a, uh, a bad guy really uh, realizes that there's a vulnerability, no. uh, a white hat or a black hat. And uh, that the vendor has not become aware of it. Uh, this can be in hardware, firmware, or software. Uh, the, um, the bad thing about zero day attacks, a lot of vendors tend to be very active and proactive in getting those out. Um, uh, you'll have cases where the vulnerability will be um, detected by uh, just a, a normal uh, software developer or hacker. It'll be published um, to the, um, to the uh, security uh, centers and uh, they'll be made aware of it. They tell the vendors about it. And uh, as I said, some of the vendors are very good in patching it immediately. Other ones, either because it's too hard to patch or they feel that it might not be that big of a vulnerability, will just go ahead and not patch it. So even a zero day attack can be out there for, for quite a while. Uh, API exploits, this is one that's starting to become more and more uh, effective in that a lot of vendors or a lot of uh, organizations are using, uh, for example, JavaScripts, uh, common JavaScripts uh, on the uh, on their web pages, and if you can drop in uh, code into that uh, 
API when they use it in their uh, so when a a target opens up a web page, it can activate the uh, the uh, the malicious code um, then and there. And now uh, remote technology is also becoming a big target as more and more people are moving to VPNs and using remote desktop protocols. Uh, we've even seen that here in our TUG uh, group in that uh, Zoom uh, originally was not completely uh, uh, encrypting its communication links and has since gone uh, full throttle and making sure it's um, uh, encrypted communication from end to end. Uh, and then finally, the Internet of Things. Um, we're seeing more and more smart devices, smart refrigerators, and as I say here, smart coffee pots. Um, and it's very easy for somebody to slip in code into one of those devices. And in most cases, it's a firmware code where they're not uh expecting to have to update it and once it's in there in a lot of cases it's very difficult to get out uh or don young has his hand up um do you oh, want to I, I, I by the way can't see it i'm just on the slide so okay uh go ahead don don you have to unmute. Hi. yes um in my uh, experience these things go in cycles. Uh, the latest cycle that seems to have occurred on my uh, iMac computer uh, is that with the emails that I get uh, in the last three or maybe four weeks, I'm getting a large number of, uh, you have won a prize uh, or you can get a big discount or something like that. If you tell us your opinion uh, on our service or you name it, uh, and it and it comes with uh, the layout or the picture to make it look like it's coming from a bona fide organization. Uh, and a lot of them have been coming with script uh, instead of uh, the usual uh, Helvetica or whatever type that my email comes. It, it a lot of this, uh, and I'm sure based on one thing that I accessed about three months or four months ago, when when we responded about having had our our third uh, virus shot, which turned out to be a, a come on to buy stuff and then to get billed for stuff. Uh, I haven't accessed any of them since that time, but uh, I'm wondering if other people have been getting this same kind of uh, uh, come on uh, malware. I'll get into that actually in the next uh, few slides about uh, how to look for it, detect it, and uh, see what you're, uh, what's happening. Actually, uh, Apple's, a uh, lot of people have said in the past that apples are secure and you don't need to run antivirus on them uh and in a lot of cases that's true because they have very strict control over what goes into the apple store and therefore it has to be scanned and processed and uh, checked so that anything you install on a mac uh is a um is bona fide and secure and doesn't contain any viruses. And so the main attack on, on, on Apple products has been through the phishing attack. Um, with Windows, on the other hand, it's, it's been pretty open and therefore um, you would download and install products not necessarily from the Google Store, and this would um, would cause uh, problems. Or very easy for the attacker to slip something in there. 
Uh, but again, we'll, we'll really get into that a little later, and then we can have uh, following follow up comments on that. And wherever practical, we prefer to hold, <coughs> excuse me, hold the questions until the end. And Mark Edelman also has his hand up, so um, let's just see what he wants at the moment. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I'll stick to ransomware. Um, can you speak at all about? individual protection against ransomware. That is to say, <clears throat> some of the anti-malware packages claim to be able to prevent or resist ransomware. Can you explain how they do that? Uh, I'll get into it a little bit later on, but the way they typically do it is uh, in the infection phase, they're using a virus, and it has, it's basically a specific type. So they'll look for that string of code when they scan your system. <clears throat> and if they see it, th that's when they can detect it and start uh, getting rid of it, hopefully before they started the encryption phase. Well, um, I had, I, I've mostly migrated away from my PC, but on my PC, I had uh, an antivirus package and it had me create a text file and place it on my drive and it, um, I would designate that file as this sort of anti-ransomware uh, key piece or something. And the software would be monitoring that file and made the claim that um, somehow, as long as that file never changed, I was safe from ransomware. I wish I understood this better. Yeah, what, what they're doing is putting out a uh, sacrificial lamb, at, be it called. In other words, they're hoping, did they, they probably had you call it a doc file or even a dot text file. Again, if, if, the, if the attacker is not, uh, really looking for specific data, it'll look for a file that has um, uh, any of the files and just start encrypting them. Uh, and uh, so what that software is doing is by monitoring that one file, if they start encrypting files on your system, it will be able to detect it. And so that's one of the ways they do it also. So in other words, they're hoping that that would be one of the first files to be encrypted. Yeah, usually they follow, uh, as you know, they want to get through your uh, system as fast as they can. And therefore, small files are a lot, better to start encrypting with than big ones because a big one can take very long to encrypt. So if they started on all your big files, like your pictures and stuff, it, it could uh, really delay their, uh, their capture of your system. Uh, and so a lot of the virus, uh, uh, pro antivirus, anti-malware, anti-ransomware are using that to, to, uh, uh, to try to detect the system. Thank you. Or, or the infection. Okay, or well, actually we'll get into some of that uh, later on. Okay, no more hands at the moment. Okay. Uh, what I want to talk about now is ransomware's business model. Um, it has really become a true business uh, and is following good old best business practices. Um, 
there was a recent article uh, in the, uh, I, I'm trying to remember whether it was the Times or the Wall Street Journal, but anyway, uh, where uh, these uh, corporations, I'll call them, uh, Ransomware Inc., it, uh, were publishing uh, uh, job requests, job posts on the internet and targeting consultants because they'd be, they wouldn't be part of a big corporation and trying to get them to uh, come work for them, help develop exciting new software. Um, uh, so, and the other thing is they've also gone into the, uh, to the business of uh, validating their software. Uh, they're using a lot of the tricks of the trade to detect ransomware and malware to, uh, to run their next version of their malware through to see if it's going to be detected or not. Um, so again, it's an ever moving target that's becoming harder and harder to prevent. Uh, and their structure is changing too. Uh, back in the old days, uh, it was one person. For example, back in the AIDS conference case, which was the first malware attack, it was one doctor who was disgruntled. Uh, here, now they're actually corporations built uh, vertically integrated. And if the organization is completely vertically integrated, they'll get 100% of the payout. They've gone to reseller channels and here what they'll have is affiliated groups. So they'll have groups uh, doing the hosting and the, um, the, uh, the infecting and will only be at, at the software development and the uh, main control, and they'll get 25% of cut of the um, of the uh, re the payout, and the uh, other parties will get 75%. And the final stage that they've really become busy in is ransomware as a service provider. And you'll see a lot of this now appearing. And I'll put an X instead of the R because you're seeing this all over. Uh, phishing as a service provider, um, uh, ransomware as a service provider, malware as a service provider. And here's the case where they've really just become a, uh, a Microsoft or a uh, an Apple uh, distributor. You buy a licensing fee for this program that will go and attack this type of system. And so you pay a flat fee or a, or a licensing fee to be able to use it uh, for so many uh, months, so many years, et cetera. And here the buyer gets 100% of whatever uh, the payout is. Uh, this is a case now where we see the uh, business model uh, really shifting in that you're now getting a lot of small entrepreneurs uh, going into the business. And they're the ones now who are probably the ones that are attacking the individual users, the home users. Um, so just to give you an, uh, a little idea of their structure, again, you have the software developers on top uh, who are really controlling the business. Then you have the hosting, and this is where they're um, uh, developing and setting up the, uh, the attacking uh, ability. You have the distributors who are sending out these packages and expecting to hear from the uh, from the victims and the uh, the uh, the uh, software that they implant in the victims and then finally the victim themselves and as you can see during the different phases that the um, 
the software as a service uh the the software developer is all there by themselves and selling it to the hosting and distribution which in a lot of cases can be one entity uh what's next uh this is what's starting to happen now uh in the past you only had uh, really two types of extortions ransom for encrypted data and ransom for not exposing sensitive data <clears throat> now a third type is coming out and that's taking the exposed data and using that to attack other victims other customers of the primary target um, even if you pay the ransom and wind up uh, getting all your data back and they didn't release those uh, uh, those damning emails that will cause Congress to come after you uh, they still have the um, uh, they still go and use the third attack to expose uh, to use to attack customers of the uh, primary target uh, as I mentioned here, phishing attacks are becoming less utilized. Uh, more and more people are becoming aware of phishing attacks. Uh, and uh, so because of the, the ability of, of, the, um, of not only the corporate, but the individuals realizing what phishing is and not uh, biting the bait, they can they're becoming less and less utilized <clears throat> uh, the other thing is they really are looking for where the big bucks are and so they're focusing on critical infrastructure something where uh has to be restored rapidly uh for example um uh the uh the pipeline that was shut down um they actually paid, I think, within two or three days um, to, to get the uh, decryption uh, key. Uh, the other, the last thing I want to talk about is the increase of state sponsored attacks. Uh, now, I'm not talking about countries' attacks. We all know that China. Um, North Korea, Russia, uh, all the countries are, are probing and attacking all the other countries for their governmental information. But um, the, the, in this case, it's the state where now they're going to tax these uh, system or, or software as a service providers or ransomware as a service providers and so they're going to take their cut and uh protect you protect the uh the service from uh being prosecuted and there has been a lot of talk and rumors that uh, russia was doing that with uh the uh, with uh, a lot of their um, ransomware attackers uh, <clears throat> and as i say here they're they tend to be high high complexity uh you have uh the states maybe giving a little information to the uh to the uh sponsored attackers on a uh, little things that they can use to maybe make their attack more effective and as i mentioned here uh can be uh highly rewarding in that they're typically targeting the the infrastructure the 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 critically dependent targets such that they're willing to pay off and not really try to circumvent the attack uh, now, what I'm going to go is give you examples of uh, some uh, malware or phishing attacks that I've received just from September and October uh, and point out just some of the interesting parts. By, by the way, one of the attacks, I didn't include it here, 
but was an email from my wife, uh, who, by the way, passed away almost two years ago. And it said, uh, I think you'd enjoy looking at this. And then, of course, it had a, a link. Um, any email that says, I think you'd enjoy looking at this, and that's all, even if it comes from a trusted sender, don't don't bite the bait. Um, here you can see AOL mail. I started to get this on September 25th and it was account security alert. So again, they're trying to scare you. Um, and again, AOL, so when I didn't bite on that, AOL account verification, then mail upgraded needed. Mail upgraded needed again hit with the email servers really uh, pounding it, trying to really scare you. Um, and down it went uh, down to uh, AOL support, Verizon mail notification again on the 6th of October. Uh, again, here's one from PayPal, uh, one from USPS notices. What the first so the first real way to detect this is say hmm this the account security alert now i have gotten those from uh aol mail which by the way is what verizon.net was so verizon.net is now aol mail and verizon moved all of its mail servers over to aol when they bought the company uh so you can say, OK, that might be a true security alert. So what you should do is not really rely on this one email, but to go to your email account, your your uh, your main main account and check and see if there's any notices there that that give you uh, that information that there is a security breach usually it's it's made um uh available quite quickly and a lot of the news uh will report it so if there is a major security breach uh, uh it it it, it, sh it will be out in the news quite rapidly um and as you can see here they keep following through they keep uh trying to to uh to dangle the bait in front of you and just hoping that you'll bite accidentally. And I think I did bite accidentally where one of these on the first, putting this presentation together, I went to the uh, to the website and I'll show you that in the next, uh, next uh, slide. But uh, I think because of that, that they were able to capture that I went there and therefore they said aha he may be able to uh, he may be interested so again they changed their lore a little bit and made it validation mail notification uh sending out and uh, uh i'll show you one of these and um so verizon mail notification starting on october 7th october 2021 email that has not been confirmed for new privacy security upgrade will be closed kindly upgrade your verizon account and accept our terms of service to avoid account shutdown and of course that's the bait upgrade now never never click on a link in email unless you are 100 percent positive that it's safe here are some ways that you can quickly get first impressions of how it's safe one of the ways is to look at the email address right that's it and what you can see is that in this case it might truly be an attack, but wait a minute, this is Verizon.net. Right. Verizon.net should be AOL, since it's AOL system, AOL support that's supposedly sending this out. 
Therefore, it shouldn't be a Verizon.net. And if you bring you by hovering over this link, you can actually see what the link address is. And you can see that it had nothing to do with uh, a Verizon or an AOL uh, address. Because, by the way, all the, the from header, the subject, and the reply to all can be easily edited um, in email when it's sent out. So don't trust, trust them completely. So my after looking at the emails, the next thing I'll do is just hover over the address and copy that address. And then I have a lot of sites I'll go to. Uh, if I think it's a phishing attack, uh, this website, uh, www.fishingtank.com, uh, you just drop it in and it'll tell you if um, uh, whether or not it, it's, been, uh, it's been reported as a phishing attack. Uh, the other one is, uh, is it malicious uh, online link scan? And that lets you drop in that link and it'll scan it and tell you um, what it's detected in, in that link. And it'll actually go down and, and go through the link and uh, see what, uh, what's been, uh, what is dangerous deeper into the link. Uh, because most of them, for example, that link that I went to <clears throat> brought up the normal AOL login script. So of course they were looking to capture your login and your password. Uh, and um, uh, so again, the, these will go into that and see that, uh, oh, wait a minute, they're not really going to uh, AOL. Uh, they're actually being siphoned off and going to a, uh, a compromised system. Uh, another one is uh, that actually is relatively new and, uh, oh, have I been pawned is another one or puned. And this will detect if your email has been uh, compromised. And that's been quite good because of all the data be breaches we've been having recently. And it'll tell you uh, that yes, your email is out there, and here are where it's it's been uh, compromised from. And then the last one is the uh, hack check from Avast.com. This is different in that it does what uh, have I been puned does, but also it knows about the passwords and will let you know what the password is that has been uh, breached. Uh, and here's an example uh, of a password leak. This is on my main account. Uh, and this is the, uh, the Avast one. Um, the leak happened on April 21st. I mean, on April 29th, 2021, what was leaked was an encrypted password. So in that way, you know, you're relatively safe because they're going to have to go through these passwords and, and check them. So uh, again, that's another good reason to have um, better encryption. And then they tell you what, where it was uh, leaked from. And here it was an app, Park Mobile, um, is where they got it. And so it's telling me to, you better change the password there because if you have a weak one, uh, it's very likely that it will be um, uh, taken. And uh, tells you that Park Mobile IO has been hit by uh, 26 uh, uh, million uh, plus uh, affected accounts. Uh, by the way, Apple uh, has 
in a lot of cases with the keychain. And I believe also, I'm not sure about Firefox, whether it's doing this yet. You probably could put an ad on, but what it does is uses your recorded passwords and will warn you saying, hey, you've used this password on the, in this lo, in this site, in this site, in this site, uh, um, you're you could be having problems. So maybe start changing them. Here is the uh, example of an email link scanner, and again, this was the results of that phishing attack. And you can see uh, the IP info was that the host provider was Webley Inc in California and was not assigned to any AOL or Verizon account or IP address. Um, and overall results may not be safe. <coughs> uh, the phishing tank, it didn't appear, so wasn't reported. Using uh, Google Safe Browser, which is again, uh, a check. It said it was safe, but the web security guard said that it wasn't safe. <clears throat> Excuse me a minute. If you ever get a red line, you know, a red light, never, never go there uh, or click on the, or enter the information. Uh, uh, again, getting back to detecting and in working with the um, with the uh, <clears throat> with ransomware and and how well you can detect it. What I have here is the uh, the time taken and the possibility of stopping the attack during the different stages of the attack. And uh, as I say, the campaign phase, again, is really the proactive defense. You make sure your systems are up to date, your software is up to date, um, it's coming from re reliable sources. And um, uh, again, using, uh, make sure you don't reuse passwords, uh, a whole bunch of things. I'll, I'll talk about it in the next slide. Uh, during the infection and staging phase, this can take seconds. Um, and here, software is probably the best way to detect it. It'll detect uh, that it's scanning your system. Um, there are ways to, to monitor your systems, both on Windows and in Mac OS to see if a process is doing a lot of disk reads. Uh, then uh, the next two phases, uh, the scanning and encryption phase. Now these, as I said, take the longest from minutes to hours. And uh, this is where most likely it'll be detected by the user. Um, the simplest way is all of a sudden you'll find your machine isn't responding as well as it used to be. Uh, that's one of the first indications if you don't have um, malware uh, detecting software on your, um, on your system. Uh, <clears throat> and as I mentioned, uh, they'll typically go after the, uh, they'll, they'll set it up to optimize their performance. So they'll go after the small files first and the bigger ones later. And then finally, payday. Uh, again, time taken, it depends. Uh, they'll usually give you a time limit uh, when, the, um, when the key won't be uh, available. Uh, but what I say here, is it really too late? Uh, actually, a lot of the older uh, ransomware software, they've already reverse engineered the encryption algorithm. And, and just like a lot of the hackers can give you the, uh, 
the quote unquote key to uh, Microsoft Office, the key to uh, Adobe Illustrator, all those things. Uh, they've now been able to decrypt a lot of the older software. So if they see if it's if it's an older virus, they can actually uh, uh, don't even need to pay the ransomware and can uh, delete it. Also, a very funny thing about this is that uh, just came across uh, the uh, the net last couple of days is that um, they also found that there was a mistake in one of their uh, viruses that was attacking the system. And so therefore they were able to, um, to prevent it by, <laughs> by stopping it in, it in its tracks. By the way, that's why they're also starting to uh, test their software to make sure they haven't made any mistakes in their coding. Uh, here's the ways to prevent attack. Again, keep firmware, operating system, and software up to date. Uh, again, mostly to prevent the zero day attack. Uh, don't assume vendor stores software is secure. Um, on Apple, for example, um, they've been very um, uh, proud, I'll say, I won't say boastful, I'll say proud that um, they, uh, they tag each software product with a key that uh, basically says whether or not the, uh, the app that you're installing has been tampered with or not. Um, sorry to say, the, uh, the attackers have been coming, become very smart and can now actually reverse engineer that key and or go to the software developer and hide their software within areas of the code that normally aren't checked. Uh, for example, um, one of the things that a lot of these packages do is the first thing it does before installing the package is to go through and do a quick survey of the system it's on to see if you can actually run this package. Um, and what you'll get is if it's a valid package, sorry, your system is not up to date. You don't have this firmware, this firmware upgrade, or you need the, those firmwares. You don't have this software. And what they've been able to do is easily drop in um, viruses, attack uh, vectors into those uh, sections of code which typically are not used in the key process. And uh, I know Apple, that's been one of Apple's uh, Achilles heel recently that they've been able to use that to uh, drop in code within uh, applications. Uh, the next thing is don't attach unknown devices or install unknown software. Uh, a lot, I. You know, being one of the hacks out there, I always, I, I'm in favor of open source. So I download a lot of open source. All of the open source vendors will give you a, um, an encryption key, which will allow, uh, allow you to validate that the code you're downloading is, uh, the code that they're publishing. Uh, and so <clears throat> if that uh, uh, key matches, you know you have the correct software. Uh, also about devices, uh, if you find a, uh, a USB stick on the, on the walkway or on the road, don't take it home and plug it into your computer. That's one of the major ways of attacking. Um, actually, uh, this, is a, this has been one of the ways that a lot of the security, <coughs> the governmental security devices have been attacked by, where 
they've either uh, swapped out a device so the carrier thinks that it's a, a, a verified device and will plug it in. Uh, even if it's a known device, by the way, there was a big um, problem with, ooh, I forget the vendor's name, but they were selling backup um, hard drives. And one of the problems that their software to do the backups had a virus in it or a malware in it. So uh, again, you, you have to be ever vigilant. Uh, and again, use and keep antivirus and malware software up to date. Uh, Avast has come out with a, a decryptor tool, which will decrypt some of the older uh, malware uh, uh, attacks. And if you look, you can see uh, the ones that it, it will uh, decrypt. Um, also, as was mentioned, there's other packages out there. You can do a, a Google search or a DuckDuckGo search and uh, look for specifically malware, ransomware, uh, antivirus software. And, and you'll see there are a few free ones, but most of them are uh, pay as you go. Uh, the next one is, as we've been talking about uh, quite a lot, use secure passwords. Password management is, I would say, is a must. And um, I'd hate to uh, say it, but I do, in a lot of cases, reuse passwords, uh, just being lazy. Uh, also, make sure you turn on multi-factor authentication. Uh, you can do that with emails. You can do that with uh, other uh, types of uh, services. So just don't think of, uh, of a login as requiring multi-factor authentication. Uh, logging and alerts. Again, keep an eye on your system know how it behaves. If all of a sudden it's really slowing down and is not responding, check it. Just both Windows and Apple have ways that you could bring up and see all the processes running. And just check to see which process is using the most CPU and see if that's something you think might or might not be a, an attack vector. Uh, and again, the final thing is principle of least privilege. Now on Apple, since it's really based on a Linux type and a Unix type environment, um, you don't really need root or super user privilege to do a lot of things. And you can be a normal user and not install software that would infect the entire system. You can install and use software that you yourself can use or your group can use. But uh, in that case, if a virus is unleashed, it would only affect you since it would only have those permissions. Uh, by the way, and Windows, they, they're they actually going over to this type of, of uh, type of uh, least privilege usage. And you can see that um, uh, a lot of the packages these days, you have to go into a terminal window or the command tool and uh, run it as administrator to be able to install something. Uh, and as I show here, how to play with dangerous things. Uh, you can just substitute me for uh, being in that case. So if you uh, want to play with things, be expecting to, for the worst to happen. And then finally, as I say here, if you want to play with dangerous things, uh, you can be reactive, set up a sandbox that you can put the uh, 
the attack software in, air gap the sandbox, which means don't have networking in or out, or don't attack attach any external disk drives or anything to it. <clears throat> Monitor all the processes. Use a debugger with breakpoints, not only for the operating system, but for the software that's running and use a decompiler. Um, that's if you really want to get into the um, nitty gritty of what's happening. Uh, and a proactive thing that's coming uh, recently and it's being used a lot. You might see this being uh, touted by a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the vendors these days is content disarm and reconstruction. And this is being used more and more by the uh, United States security agencies. And what this is is any email. Um, uh, any device like a any file or anything that's coming through the uh, their air gap is processed by this. And what it does is it reads it first, looks for any. Um, so, for example, the simplest case is let's say a um, a a word document that has a malicious uh um macro in it since macros can be written in visual basic it, it's very easy to uh, uh to put it within that document so what it what it does is it removes all of the um the 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 um the executables anything that can really uh, be harmful. And then after doing that, it'll put everything back together again so that you can get some semblance of what it meant to, to give you. So if you had a fancy spreadsheet that used a lot of um, uh, fancy macros, uh, it may not work. <laughs> But again, uh, it's been proven that this is quite effective in in getting uh, getting rid of uh, of uh, of malware and not allowing a lot of infections to get through. Okay, that's it for my presentation. Let's go and answer questions. Al, you're the first one. Uh, great uh, presentation, George. Very informative and valuable. Um, what do you recommend for an anti-malware, antivirus uh, tool for an iMac these days? Yeah, recommending. Um, there are some um, websites out there where you, um, where they specifically go out and test uh, malware um, tools, uh, ransomware tools, virus detection, uh, Trojans, uh, all those types of things, and publish their findings. Um, the um, is it ISA, Internet Security Agency? Anyway, uh, they publish a quarterly report that gives you the which ones are the latest and the greatest. And it does change, but you can usually see the, um, the, the a vast, um, uh, uh, Kerbero, uh, not Kerberos, uh, Oh, no, oh, I mean, it's like Kerberos. Kabra Kabrowski, is it? And anyway, um, you usually see most of the major ones in, in the top list right now. I think Avast has been one of the major ones 
uh, that um, has been um, been uh, using it to, uh, or been actually going out and uh, producing software specifically for malware. And as you can see, they, they've come out with that uh, handy dandy um, uh, check on passwords. Mm -hmm. So, and the other thing is Avast actually has a free version uh, that you can run that is, uh, is uh, pretty reasonable. But the other thing is you still have to be vigilant. Uh, nothing really can protect you 100%. Thank you. Were you trying to think of Kaspersky? That's it, Kaspersky. <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, um, if, if you just Google um, mal, uh, anti malware, anti uh, ransomware reviews 2021, uh, you'll see that a lot of PC Magazine usually puts one out also. Uh, a lot of the uh, companies you can also uh, check, as I said, um, um, uh, somebody just texted it in the, um, uh, hold on a second. Uh, let's see, Walt said uh, Sophos for Apple. Yeah, I've, I've installed Sophos. Somebody recommended it that used to work for Bell Labs and I've been using it. Mm. And uh, anyway, um, it, it really depends on, on what your, your, uh, your uh, true, um, true needs are. Again, since I do play with dangerous things, <laughs> uh, I do expect uh, uh, that things that I bring in might be hit, so I do hide them, you know, from the uh, uh, anti-malware, anti anti-virus that I, I'm, I've been running. And I do use Avast. Uh, I find that to be the least, uh, um, the least, uh, the the least invasive into the operating system and to the performance of the computer. Hey, John Tomaszewski. Yeah, hi. Uh, great talk. I loved it. Uh, however, I got uh, a question, and then I want to show something in the screenshot that I got recently that I think we should make our people aware of. Uh, the question is, can you ever get run into a problem by opening the email, not by clicking on the link or anything? Can that cause a problem? Yes, there are ways. Um, a lot of emails these days now use HTML. And so you can embed within the email um, executable code, JavaScripts, other nasty things. And so if you view it as an HTML file, it can activate that code. Uh, that's why a lot of the, uh, the security mavens tell you that if you want to be perfectly safe, set it up so you can only view text mode in your email. Oh. So when you view it, only view it in text mode. And then you're pretty safe. And I'd like to just show an email that I got that I thought was really interesting. If I can do a screen share here for a second. There it is. Can everybody see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, what I thought was interesting about it is it's not claiming to do anything uh, you know, it doesn't want you to hit on a link or anything, but as you'll notice, if you read it, 
it says that they just charged me $499.99 for a 12 month subscription to your account. Well, the first thing I did, of course, was check my bank uh, to, to notice whether there was something in it. But what I thought was interesting, if you look at the bottom in blue, it says to contact them and feel free. Otherwise, that it, you get one day to, to contact them. Otherwise, they're going to put the charge through. Now, of course, when I saw it, I immediately realized that I don't use that um, uh, McAfee software right now. So I kind of figured it was phony. But I just wanted to let people know. I don't know what happens when you call the number because I didn't want to bother. But uh, that, I thought that was interesting that they're actually and I got that was also interesting is I got one, I think, that said the same thing for Norton right after that. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's that, interesting that, that the McAfee is spelled wrong. It's MCA as opposed to MAC. <laughs> well, I didn't even notice that. But <laughs> uh, let's see. How do I get out of this now? Stop. If something is capitalized, it shouldn't be. Hmm. But uh, yeah. I just thought that was interesting, and I, I hope I didn't. It doesn't have HTML in it. I don't know if. Uh, no, no. They again. That was scareware. They're trying to scare you and use social engineering to have you. Uh, click on that link or call that phone number. And if you call that phone number, they'll say, well, give us your credit card number. We'd like to check and make sure that or reverse the charges. Uh, that's what it is. <laughs> OK. Thank so you. Th that's probably there. And by the way, it'd be interesting if you could capture that link at the bottom of that email. I don't know if you've deleted it or not yet. Uh, and then put it in one of those tools that I mentioned. Um, it would. Be, I don't think there was a link on that one. It was just a phone number. No, that part in the blue above the phone number. Might oh, okay. Have been a All right. But again, it, it could have also been just the phone number. I know I've seen those from uh, uh, Microsoft, as I mentioned, where they try to uh, to scare <laughs> you and want you to. Uh, to call this number uh, and then of course what do they want to do they they want to either two things one is they want you to okay i'll help you debug it open up your system uh for remote uh hosting and remote yeah. diagnosis so they can get in and start um uh capturing your system or like i mentioned here's the here's your credit card we need your credit card number please do this yeah i i had that situation happen to me one time i got a call once and i you know i for some reason i was suckered on and i they said go to your computer so i went to my computer and they said oh we want to download this software so we can see what you're doing and i go oh that ain't happening mm -hmm. and so i started getting regular phone calls from from different people you know telling me that I'm, I'm interfering with the network we'd like to help so i finally got one from this young lady and uh, she says, uh, uh, we'd like, she says, we, we can help you with this problem. And I go, oh, that's great. I've been hoping you'd call. And she says, she says, oh, what's your problem? And I says, well, it's with my mouse. And so she said, well, what's the problem with your mouse? I know I can help you with that. I says, yeah, can you take that mouse and stick it up your, <laughs> as far as. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, thanks, Dirk. Okay, Griff is next, um, and we are, um, it's uh, already 10 after 1, so let's try, and we have six more questions or six more hands up at the moment, so let's try to be judicious and end by 1.30. Griff. Okay. Um, have you seen any cases where the file permission settings aren't strong enough to uh, keep someone from breaking into my file system. Um, I'm pretty paranoid about this. I have uh, five different accounts on my, uh, on my iMac, and only one of them has administrator uh, privileges, and it's the only one I use for installing software from anybody. Uh, so I and I've been assuming that that's probably strong enough to keep most people out because they and the second thing I do is for um, <clears throat> the place where I keep all my photographs. Uh, I set almost every file in the photography tree to be read only 
and I only I only use the use KSH to go in and occasionally change permissions uh, if I want to uh, for editing purposes. But most of the time, I keep everything completely locked up with the uh, from uh, any, any modification. Uh, are these is the malware typically uh, prevented from doing any real damage when it, uh, as long as I've followed that rule of uh, setting everything to be uh, read only, both read group and other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in a lot in a lot of cases, it's pretty safe, but not completely. Um, the typical way of attack is they find a hole in a program that changes and becomes root. Uh, for example, a, a program such as your uh, mail server, if you're running a mail server on your system, uh, it has to be root because it has to change the owner of the mail coming in and going out. So it has to do a change user on that file. And actually, the Morris worm uh, was the uh, used, I believe, the send mail, the original Unix send mail on the Sun and uh, BSD, uh, a hole in that to uh, replicate the worm and send it out. So once somebody gains root access, and yes, you can gain root access uh, by having all your everything set down to no execute, no write. Um, but one of the, what they've been doing to compromise that is setting up users such as a mail daemon, a line printer daemon, all these daemons that don't have the full security of the administrator or root to be able to do, to take over the entire system. So in effect, they could wipe out all of the, the uh, email, but they're not gonna get all of your files. Okay. Um, okay, Rich well, Lager. You all, yeah, okay. I don't, okay. Get I don't wanna hang on too long. But by the way, there are ways of getting into almost anything. Okay, Rich, you're um, next. Yeah, thank thank you, George. Um, uh, if, if if I may, uh, sort so, of sort of two questions. Hopefully, uh, the first one quickly. I saw one of your uh, bullet points uh, started out API, and I had the impression from that that websites we go to may actually have been compromised, and just going to the website we might have something come onto our computer. Um, is is that is that real? How much should we be worrying about that? I mean, I I, I have no way of you know checking the the kinds of websites I go to. They're uh, the, the normal ones. Yeah, um, mostly it's adware um, where they're tracking you. Um, so uh -huh. if, if you have ad blockers and other things running, uh, you're, and also a lot of the antivirus software, anti-malware software will scan a, uh, the HTML as it's coming down and look for JavaScripts or anything that might be malicious coming down with it. Okay, so, that leads, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, but, Again, there are still ways you can circumvent that. Okay, that leads right into the, my, my second question. Uh, I formed the opinion that on my PC, having Windows Defender uh, was enough protection without, uh, I used to have McAfee and I, I dropped that. So the question is, is on my PC, Windows Defender enough? Or should I really be getting a another package of security software and putting that on, which, if I understand things correctly, would 
would uh, disable Defender that the uh, Defender would not work if you put something else on. Right. So what's your advice there? Um, in, in the case of Net Defender, uh, actually, it's been improved quite a bit. Um, you can actually, uh, I, I would say, use it as opposed to putting in any other virus software packages. But when it comes to malware and uh, ransomware, uh, I don't think it has all the ability of, of um, the tools that have been specifically designed for malware capture. And uh, I believe, I think I saw somebody who had posted a, uh, uh, the PC uh, magazine uh, ratings of uh, ransomware software detectors. And some of them are actually free. And so I would recommend that you run that also. The, the advantage to that is it's only going to be looking for malware, not viruses. So therefore you won't have duplicate and effort and wasting CPU cycles. Thanks. Okay, Mar Pincus. Thank you. I was going to ask a similar question to what Rich uh, asked. Uh, over the years, I've used uh, AVG and malware bytes. And lately, the IT guy that set up my computer, Windows, uh, said, you don't need any of that because you have uh, Defender. And like Rich, I still have Defender and I got rid of malware bytes and AVG. And just wonder if what you're saying, if, if I if I should add at least malware bytes to it, because Defender would take care of the viruses, hopefully, and the malware bytes would take care of the malware. And would they conflict with each other? Do you recommend both or what exactly? Yeah, malware bytes. I what I usually do is download it and use the free version. So if I've been playing with dangerous things, as I mentioned, uh, just to make sure, uh, I'll bring down malware bytes and scan my system for one quick check. Um, but I don't think you need to purchase malware bytes um, as as a full in, in fully installed product because one of the things it also does is does the virus checking that uh, Defender does. Um, so I'd look for a specific um, specifically. Uh, uh, software package that just goes after ransomware and malware. Thank you. And again, that, that, that article, uh, if you look through the meeting uh, chat, you'll see it. I think somebody mentioned the PC Magazine article. For, for quick information, Mal, I've got the free version of malware bytes on my computer, and it exists very nicely with Defender. Okay, good. Yeah. Ed Aiken? Okay. Does Apple do anything differently where, where you don't have to do this with the ransomware or malware? I don't seem to get any of these problems. Well, as, as I mentioned before, uh, I, had, I had a Dell before. I had a lot of problems with this nonsense. I don't seem to get it now. Yeah, the two things that Apple... Um, had going for it were the uh, tight control they had over the applications that were downloaded and the uh, Unix-like um, uh, permissions priority. So you typically wouldn't be running your normal system as root or administrator, where in Windows you are. 
And that's why, <clears throat> excuse me a second. That's why most of the attacks in Apple were phishing attacks because there they can gain control. But now, uh, as I mentioned, they are figuring ways around the, um, the tight control that Apple has over the uh, downloaded applications and are hiding in other locations such that the encryption key um, really uh, becomes ineffective. Thanks very much. I get the phone calls from Amazon every so often, grandma said, Accounts been charged. You know, those are obviously scam calls. I don't even have an Amazon account. <laughs> yep. But, yes, they use the phone a lot. Um, I get them from the IRS too, and all sorts of other organizations. Jim Blaine, right. you're next. Yes. Yeah, I saw an article recently talked about this wire cutter, and they were doing saying the same thing that you just said, which was defenders enough. You don't need the other. Uh, antivirus software. So, um, you know, just to pile on that particular recommendation. So here's a question for people who, about the Morris worm. I have this faint recollection that, you know, Bob Morris worked at Bell Labs, but was it his son that was the one that did the worm? Did yeah, anybody? yes. They were both Robert T. Morris. Right. If I might comment on this, uh, oh, Robert yeah. Morris Sr. was in the office next to mine, and mm -hmm. he was a whiz at security and many right. other things. Yeah. Our belief was that Robert Morris Jr. wanted to impress his father, who was not that easily impressed. <laughs> so he created this worm. But it, as uh, George mentioned, it got out of control. Um, and Robert Morris Jr. is a really nice guy. And uh, I don't think of him as a felon, but he was found guilty for unleashing it because it, his uh, mistake made it very expensive to eliminate the, wor the his worm from a lot of uh, websites. But well, it's an interesting... Uh, uh, family issue that we noted. Now, was it true that uh, Robert Morris Jr. had worked uh, at Bell Labs in the summer? Was it that summer? He had interned and I think it was the summer before. Uh -huh. So he was, he was a graduate student somewhere or at, at the yeah. time? Yes. He, he, was, he was a graduate student, I think, uh, was it Harvard or Cornell? Mm -hmm. um it might have been and, Cornell. Uh, i'm not i don't remember. I think it was Cor cornell mm -hmm. and he's now a professor at mit or was a professor at mit it was funny i just personal recollection on the day that the, the morris worm hit in the morning i happened to be at berkeley doing a recruiting trip for the statistics department and so i was there in the in their in the statistics department space and the uh, computer science department was right next door. So they all knew each other. And, and people came in and said, oh, there's this thing happening on the internet. You know, I, I mean, not on the internet. At first they thought something was happening on their network. And it was, uh, it was getting, you know, it was interfering with the uh, computing and so on and so forth. But those guys at Berkeley, then somebody got in touch by phone with somebody at Bell Labs and said, hey, it's happening here too. And gradually they realized it was happening everywhere. And I was kind of sitting at Berkeley, uh, like, like getting a bird's eye view of what was happening in the computer science department there as they realized that this was all happening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Walt Meister. I was in my office in uh, Bell Labs at the com uh, Computer Center for the Business Analysis Center and was uh, in involved in shutting things down quickly before any of our machines got damaged. Okay, well, we still have two more questions and um, we're, we're running close to two hours. So, uh, Will okay. Meister next. Okay, can people hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that was a very good presentation. Uh, about a decade ago, I took a online MOOC course at Coursera called the Economics of Malicious Software. And basically it 
talked about how it became a business and different people do different parts of the business. Somebody writes the software, you know, each piece of the software, not all of it. And so somebody distributes it and other, you know, other people use it. And, you know, but actually, you know, what I found out through this course, and this is before ransomware, it was really quite scary because, um, you know, these antivirus software programs, you know, they, they scan everything and they're looking for a key for a particular software, you know, particular, you know, anti, you know, particular virus software. And but what, what they've gotten is, you know, they've gotten so sophisticated is that they encrypt the executable on a, on a per instant basis, you know, for each machine and they decrypt it on the fly when they want to use it. So in this case, antivirus software has a real problem, you know, matching up the binary pieces that identify a, a particular virus software. And, you know, one of the questions I asked was, well, how do people find vulnerabilities in, in systems? Well, you know, I thought maybe they worked for Microsoft and they understood the code behind the operating system and they, they see potential, you know, vulnerabilities, but actually they use a technique called fuzzing where they just throw things, I guess, through the inter, you know, through a internet connection at the PC and see what breaks. And that's how they find a lot of the vulnerabilities. And the other thing is, you know, the researchers that research the virus software, um, they usually like to set up honeypots in sandboxes. And rather than using a real machine, they'll use a virtual machine so that they can monitor the progress of the virus with the real machine. And the problem with that is, the the, anti, the virus software got so sophisticated, it actually detects whether it's running in real time or in a, on a virtual machine. So it, you know, <laughs> and it brings up the terminology red pill, blue pill, because that's how they determine whether it was, you know, on the real machine or the virtual machine. Okay. And, um, Let's end it. Any, anyway, I got to the point where I realized just writing a, antivirus software must be incredibly difficult. And um, yeah. anyway, and, and the other thing is, I think in the news recently, they, I think it was on 60 Minutes, you know, they talked about, um, you know, malicious software that was, that was installed. It's basically like a bot and it's waiting for instruction. And people have like no idea. I mean, it, it could be anything. It could just be peek and poke around the system or it could be taken down machines or the internet or whatever. It depends on the payload that's being sent to it. So this stuff gets very difficult to, you know, you know, for researchers to, um, you know, bait, you know, to figure out what's going on. So um, anyway, so you know, and and since the stuff is encrypted, they don't know what it does until the code is actually the virus software is actually decrypted and running. It's only then that they know what it's supposed to be doing. Otherwise, they have no idea. So, you know, the world got very complicated very quickly. Anyway. Um, again, I... again, let me just say that it is a, a reactive business being an antivirus, anti-malware developer in that um, <clears throat> they will actually go out and look for uh, uh, zero day vulnerabilities or any of the other vulnerabilities in a system. But most of it is um, something appears on the network, how can we stop it? And so they're writing code just to uh, scan the system, scan what's coming in, <coughs> where uh, actually the only real proactive is where you just don't allow anything in. Everything is, uh, you, uh, you basically, as I mentioned, <clears throat> where it deactivates and rebuilds the, <clears throat> the, uh, the software that you're bringing in. Um, so uh, again, 
nothing is 100% on computers. There's always somebody going to find a loophole or a way to get in. Uh, another thing I want to mention is I came across the web about the simple hardware device you can build to put between a memory stick and a USB port. And it makes it a read-only device, so nothing, it could never be booted. And I didn't, I didn't bookmark it. And I tried looking for it later, and I could never find it. You know anything about that? No, no. Uh, the easy way to do that is uh, just make it an NTFS file system on on your uh, on your iMac, <laughs> because the default system can't write NTFS. But I, but let's say I don't even know what file system is being used on the memory stick. You know. No, no, it isn't really. So no, uh, no. If you're going to, as I said, the the best way to handle things like that is to have a sandbox machine that's air gapped. Um, you just don't know what's going to be on it. I see. Okay. Well, thanks for a good talk. Thank you, Jim Bagan. You're the last questioner. Okay. Uh, just continuing on with the, the ransomware um, uh, as it works, um, in the Colonial Pipeline case, that was where they shut down the oil pipelines mm -hmm. to the East Coast. Um, the government was able to trace the cryptocurrency through 23, they, they apparently, as it's being processed, they put it through 23 separate processes the government was nonetheless able to trace the cryptocurrency through all these, what they call mixers or tumblers. And then it ended up in a wallet, which had a password. And the government was able to somehow or other get around that password and recover two and a half million dollars or so. Uh, and uh, the, um, I, I don't, they, I think the government, the government is putting a lot of pressure on all these companies to immediately report any kind of uh, ransomware uh, event. Uh, and I think all any government, any company that does any business with the government, they have to immediately report it. But the government seems to have some pretty formidable capabilities because you've got this blockchain and the blockchain is public. Uh, but um, this has also been designated a national security matter. Uh, and that means that there's probably a lot of things that the government can do uh, that probably are not going to see the light of day. And the one thing I'm aware of that might be somewhat analogous was an FBI operation called Operation Playpen. Operation Playpen involved a software or a, a, porn a child pornography uh, operation. And the government got a search warrant for the uh, uh, for the pornography website. And what they did then, they took it over and they got a, a warrant that effectively allowed them to put malware on every, every uh, entry into uh, this uh, software pornography. And it resulted in hundreds and hundreds of arrests throughout the world. Now, query, uh, is the government, and this is the way they did drug cases. They, they, I was a federal prosecutor, and sometimes the best thing to do was just follow the money. Where the hell the money ended up was where you, you know who the big players were. But it seems like the government is putting a lot of emphasis on, all right, let's trace the money, let's go back, identify the bad guys, and then force all these people to immediately report the ransomware events so they develop a, a massive database. Um, and it's so I, I think, you know, it, it's kind of a pessimistic and gloomy thing. But I think the government, and again, a lot the government wouldn't talk about a lot of this, even though it might be, you know, popular to do so, but they're not going to do anything that uh, compromises uh, what they're doing. Uh, but because this has been, unlike Operation Playpen, which, which was not uh, a national security, this has, I've heard it many times mentioned, that they consider this national security, the ransomware. Uh, so I think there's a lot going on that maybe could cause us to have at least some optimism that we're getting a handle on this. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with that in that 
Um, but that actually brings us up to another talk, which would be on cyber warfare. Uh, and that's where the governments are using this. And as I mentioned in one of my last slides about national uh, actors being in state sponsored actors being involved um, there you the country is giving uh, the uh, the malware writers uh, a um, a uh, an insight as to vulnerabilities and so what we'd like to be able to do is track that and uh, yeah the Again, it's it's an ever evolving uh, process. Um, for example, the first uh, true uh, damaging uh, malware was written by the U.S. one of the government agencies that went in and basically destroyed the Iranian uh, centrifuges by going in, putting in a virus that was able to get a hold of the control systems and report that everything was okay when it wasn't, when it, they were actually uh, speeding up the, uh, the centrifuges and they eventually just blew up. So um, cyber warfare is something, and, and again, it's, it's one of the major concerns. And that's what everybody's saying. The next war will be cyber warfare, uh, that the conventional warfare probably won't be happening anymore. Thank you. So okay. I, raised, I raised my hand. I actually would like to say something else. Sure. Please be quick. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, OK. So um, there's something, uh, a resource that's available, George. I don't know whether you could get access to it, but uh, but while, while I was working at um, Belcor or Telcordia in the last couple of years there, um, I, I actually saw some malware, you know, in the wild on one of the websites that I was running for somebody. And I tracked it down and drilled down and, and reverse engineered the code and learned a lot of interesting things about it. And I happened, I've given a talk at Olcord on this a long time ago, but I, I happened to mention it or my supervisor happened to mention it to this computer security group that they had in research there. And they got really interested in that because he was an employee who was tracking down, you know, reverse engineering malware. And they wanted to submit a, a research proposal for it for a grant. So they asked if they could use my case. Anyway, as a result of that, they gave me access to um, a, a a, a service somewhere, and I don't remember the name of it now, but it's a service that's provided probably by a government agency to organizations uh, and individuals who are doing uh, a study of these, 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 uh, this, you know, malware and, and whatnot, the same sort of thing that you, you apparently like to do. And the way it worked is that you would, if you got an account there, you could go, you could log over there and you could say, okay, uh, give me, uh, and they, they set up virtual machines and it could be Unix or it could be Windows, it could be Apple, whatever kind of virtual machine you want. And they give you any number of uh, instances of that virtual machine. And you'd tell it, you know, you click boxes and tell you how, it want, how you want it to be configured and which operating system, which version of this, that, and the other thing. And a little of this and a little of that. And then they, they give you this collection of sort of virtual machines to play with. And then you could bring in your, your malicious code and put it on one. And you had sort of extra uh, tools outside of the operation operating system that let you sort of monitor what was happening on the various virtual machines that you were managing. So it gave you a whole little laboratory for doing exactly what you're talking about. You would love that. <laughs> <laughs> you ought to look, see if, you, if an individual like you could get access to it uh, at, at no cost. Yeah, I'll have to see, but I also, uh... There are some uh, private uh, uh, security groups uh, that are out there that do similar things, not, not as lavish, but uh, do uh, try to reverse engineer uh, the malware, the uh, ransomware, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. It's fun. 
it's a it's an intellectual challenge but it's a lot yeah. of fun to do that <laughs> well we've managed to go for two hours george thank you ever so much you obviously hit a nerve with um, your topic and uh certainly we had a lot of interesting discussion 